where's your life force going? And, and if it's going in, a, in a, a direction that doesn't satisfy you, it's going to look for, for other av avenues Absolutely. of expression. The anima can take on not only a male or a female uh, inner appearance, it can take on that of an animal. You can have bestiality. You know? It can take on the form of a child or a baby or a corpse. People come up to me with Jordan Peterson's reading list all the time. They're like, oh, should I start here? No, don't start there. He's got the painted bird on his reading list. Why would you read the painted bird? Follow your instincts and do what you want to do or else you're going to end up getting not particularly happy. Hey guys, and welcome back to Ask Adept Psychologist, a monthly Q&A podcast where we take your questions submitted at the $10 tier or higher on Patreon and we toss it between ourselves and we take a crack at them. As always, timestamps will be in the description down below in case you don't want to watch the whole thing, you want to skip to your question or whatever, I guess, strikes up your fancy. Now, I do have a little announcement before we go into this. This previously was once per month. Now, because of the volume of questions, it is going up to twice per month. So there's now more opportunity for you to get your questions answered if indeed you want to. And as always, of course, I'm joined by Steve and Pauline. Currently in the reservoir, we've got 16 questions. We probably won't get through them all today, especially if we do what we normally do, which is to answer these questions in as much depth as we possibly can. But to kick things off, we've got a question from Moose Man. And Moose Man asks, is it possible for an individual, be it man or woman, to have both anima and animus? Or is it strictly contrasexual to each one's gender? What do you guys think? Well, this is, a, this, is, this is a good question, really. Um, the guys who are just coming into Jung, and by just coming in, I would mean within the last 10 years or so, probably missed a lot of the action that was going on in the 1980s and early 1990s in some Jungian circles, where there were people proposing that a man would have both an animus and an anima. And it got rather silly, in, in my view. Um, I would say absolutely not, uh, and I would also say that the designation of the anima or the animus as a contrasexual archetype in and of itself is something that should be questioned rather than just accepted on, on dogmatic grounds. In reality, and I mean in the real world rather than in theory, in a clinical setting when you're working with real people, you don't meet this kind of thing at all. What you do meet is the function of relating. Now, the, the function of relating is projected, depending on all sorts of circumstances, externally out onto one or both sexes, depending on the life trajectory and inclination of the individual concerned. As soon as you start to complicate that with gender, you start to run into exceptions to that, and clinically that's a problem. If you're just studying young yourself or amongst a group of friends, perhaps of the same age and the same background, you won't see that much variability. If you work clinically, you will see variability. And at that point, you have to solve the problem for yourself of what presents empirically. Now, on that basis, I would consider the relating function to be the thing that we call the anima or the animus. And that function then clusters around it experiences that we would call the anima or the animus <clears throat> complex. Now, obviously for a, a male child, um, bearing in mind that a statistically normal family, statistically, I'm not saying normal beyond that, this is just a numbers game, then in a statistically normal fam family, a male child will imprint his relating function on his female caregiver, if, if he has, of course, a female caregiver. But we're talking about statistics here. So that then is transferred further out, mm. and it's under pressure from the genome, the genomic self, the psychological concept of the self, along the ego-self axis. However you want to model that for yourself, but I'll make it very clear that I'm conceiving of this as coming from the genome and this being genetic and therefore inherited and there are lifespan development pressures and instincts involved in that imprinting process. So at that point then the unconscious of the individual tends to take on a form which is gender specific. So in that sense you can say that the anima becomes female or wears a woman's face. That will mean that the relationship of a man 
to his unconscious is mediated through on the inside an imago that wears a woman's face, hence the anima complex. The deeper you go into the psyche, then the closer you get to what Jung called archetypes. And at that point too, you will experience what appears to be the image of a woman. Again, in, in the same context of a statistically normal male who is imprinted on a female caregiver and has been carried forward. And so it goes on. Then in your psychosocial relationships, under genetic pressure, because biologically men are primed to want to relate to women for reproductive and for social purposes, you get then the projection of this anima image in a female form. The same is true for women. However, it's complicated. It's complicated in the cases of bisexuality, and it's complicated in the case of um, homosexuality, whether that's male or female, and it's also different for women. Because obviously, a woman is born from the same gender, whereas men are not. And as I've mentioned before, and I've suggested this as a thought experiment, for the guys out there, they can run this and then see how it pans out for them. Imagine then that you were not born from woman, but you were born from man. That in effect, your father was your, your birth parent. And then that your relating was imprinted on the male gender or the male biological sex, your own sex. But at the same time, you're going eventually at least to be under instinctive pressure to transfer that over on to the opposite sex, onto women, for reproductive and for psychosocial purposes. But nevertheless, your early imprinting is onto the same sex, the same gender. This will affect your sense of identity. It will also affect how you relate to your own sex in terms of emotional relationship and perhaps even in terms of erotic relationship as well. Now this is something that women go through naturally, but men do not in a statistical sense. So there are many, many complications and the best way to, go, to get around this is to accept what comes in and don't apply any kind of overlay theoretically onto that. Which is another reason why I emphasize the relating function or the relating factor in an individual psyche and then see how that appears naturally without interpretation for that person. That then can be understood in terms of their life and their trajectory through life over their lifespan development and it becomes part of their personal myth. So yes, uh, sexuality is obviously important. It's biologically important, it's psychosocially important, it's culturally important. But there, there is a difference and uh, the observed and recorded differences in women's sexuality, in particular to do with its fluid nature, could perhaps be explained because they are born from the same gender and they have a physical and emotional and nurturing contact with their own gender that men don't have in the same way. Also the nature of how the animus according to Jung develops could be explained quite simply by going back and looking over that very very early relationship that women have to their own gender and then to the complete strangeness that men will be towards them and yet they're under instinctive and um, psychosocial pressure to bond to them under genetic pressure as well. So to say then that, that a man or a woman can have an animus or an anima is really to complicate things far too much. Now I've been um, criticised for straying too far apparently from Jung's basic structures. Well I make no excuse for that but I will explain. Paul and I work in the real world with real people and Jung 101 in a clinical sense is that you set all theory aside all theory aside and simply experience the phenomenon the fact of the human individual and their nature as it has unfolded throughout their life as it comes in to meet you on that basis you simply cannot impose any kind of structure to it it's utterly pointless to say to someone who's coming in with uh, some terrible phobia or neurosis or psychosomatic condition that they have a problem with their anima 
And to say that there's an issue over relating, they can understand that. Mm. Then, it, if necessary, to get the result mm. that you're there to get for that person, it becomes important to address these deeper theoretical structures. Yes, you can do it, of course you can. And Pauline and I have worked in depth on a spiritual and transpersonal level with so many people. And at that level, of course, the classical Jungian interpretation of the anima or the animus is entirely applicable. And in those circumstances, we address that and we address it at that level. But for the vast majority of people, it's something you don't need to do. You really don't. Mm. And the minute you start to impose a structure, and this broadens out and includes typology, it includes the concept of the shadow, pretty much all of that, archetypes as well, most of these things are utterly irrelevant when it comes to real world clinical practice. If you're doing self-development, yeah, of course, you can indulge that and you can follow that wherever, that rabbit hole, really. In fact, it's a warren of rabbit holes, uh, wherever it may lead. But as soon as you have the privilege of working in depth with other people, then this all becomes very, very relative. And you cannot clutter your mind and cannot clutter the mind of others with theoretical constructs that may have no applicability whatsoever. So this is why I make my focus for the animal and the animus as the relating function. And what went wrong with the Jungians, and most of them were in the so-called uh, London School um, that was originally founded by Michael Fordham, who was involved in the, um, the collected works uh, in English, the English translation. Um, and he was also uh, behind bringing Melanie Klein's Object Relations School of Psychoanalysis into a syncretistic relationship with Jung's model. Um, the, these, these guys went f much, f much further away from Jung than ever I've done, and yet they're considered to be the orthodox. Um, I have never met anybody, anyone, who has said, I have a problem because I have both an anima and an animus. They may have said that they're bisexual, but the relating function is not reducible to sexuality. It's quite possible, and you see it all the time in a clinical setting, and you can experience it in daily life, for people to have sex and to not relate to another human being as a human being at all, nor indeed to relate to themselves on the inside. Sexuality is independent of these constructs, and these constructs are independent of sexuality. Because there are plenty of people who, who voluntarily are celibate, but they relate really, really well. They have a spiritual life, have a spiritual dimension, and they can work on the inside. And they may well do that with a, a completely different system, an Eastern tradition, a Western occult tradition, another psychological model, completely different. And the concept that the young formulated of the anima in, in, in those terms doesn't translate and has no applicability or understanding to people who come to this through a different lens. So you have to find the bridge, the thing that makes sense of all of it. And the thing that makes sense of all of these variations in theory are the facts of human nature. And then what Jung called the anima is a relating function and a relating factor. Then if you need to develop that further in contact with another person, you can do it. But that flexibility comes about through experience because otherwise all you have is theory. And if you begin to live a theory, in effect, all you're doing is creating a complex for yourself that you decide to live by, and then you filter everything, all of your experiences through that. So, in my view, no, people don't have an anima or animus. People who are bisexual don't. They have a relating function which focuses either on men or women. Simple. It, it's as simple as that. Look at a relating function, and then if it takes on a particular character or flavour, it might be appropriate with that individual to say, yes, this is an inner woman or an outer woman, or there's a correlation between the inner image and the outer image, and this leads you to your spirituality. But for some people, some religious people, men for example, perhaps in the Catholic Church, then there's, a, there's quite a significant absence of development of the anima as an imago, unless it's through the Blessed Virgin. And in that sense, it's very much contained and reduced. And that causes a lot of problems. Because sexuality, eroticism, uh, simple contact and touch has been displaced. But the relating function and instinct to relate is still there. 
and this can cause terrible neurosis and it can also in the worst of cases lead to the industrial level of paedophilia that you get in churches unfortunately so relating and sexuality are not the same thing and what image the relating function chooses or is conditioned to respond to is independent too of sexuality except insofar as someone has an over sex drive and some people do and then you, you might get a very very wide generalization of the relating function the whole thing can be mixed up you certainly get this in sexual psychopaths and again without clinical experience of working with these people you have no idea what you're going to meet and when you do it can be a big shock a huge shock because the anima can take on not only a male or a female uh, in a appearance it can take on that of an animal you can have bestiality you know it can take on the form of a child or a baby or a corpse so people need to need to wake up and understand what the real world's like if they've still got the head inside theory books and i'm sorry to be so blunt about this but there's absolutely no value in, in what Pauline and i can bring unless we share real world experience so thank you mooseman for that thank you yeah, this this is the, the the contrast between you guys or us and the rest of the Jungian material on the internet. The difference becomes so stark, and that's why potentially people will start projecting things against you two or myself or anything else because it's so different. Because I can understand questions like that because I've I've grown up. I, I learnt young i guess through the internet first and foremost with all the personalities talking about it whether it be the shadow or the animal so i, I can understand because generally what it looks like is, is the path of development for the theory is like well you have an anima and then or if you're a man you have an anima and then you project said anima onto a sexy woman purely sexually so somehow instinct gets conflated with the idea of anima projection then the problem comes in because you can also project against men so it seems projection as such is equated with the anima generally speaking, without properly thinking about it. That's just a general presupposition. And then the question is, well, if the anima is only ever projected against women and hot women or beautiful women, then how can I be projecting against men? Does that mean I have an animus or does that mean I'm gay or what does that mean? So the way you guys have put it in terms of relating and that it's independent, I think is very, very useful for people to know because all that fluff goes out the window and you can project against people irrespective of their gender for many, many, many different reasons that don't necessarily have to involve you know, basic reproduction or anything like that. So yeah, I think that's a very useful answer. The next question then comes from Nightchild. And Nightchild asks, to what extent is a relationship with a member of the opposite sex necessary in the development of the anima or animus respectively? So that's one question. And you ask a second question here too, which is also Steve. I believe you mentioned that you used method writing when writing your screenplay. I too am trying to write a screenplay based on a dream that I had, which I've been trying to understand for some time. I'd like to go about understanding this with the help of our Discord. Could you please speak on how you engage in your creative process? Also for Pauline and your artwork. Now, uh, of course, guys, you're going to answer that second question. But to just direct you on the creativity stuff, you submitted this question before we released one of our most recent videos, which is called uh, re Reviving Your Creativity or something like that. It's a few videos released before this one. So that will help address that question in great detail. But uh, apart from that, you can choose which one you, you want to tackle, guys, about a um, uh, member of an opposite sex necessary in the development of the anima and the animus or your own creative process. I'll leave which one you want to answer up to you first. Um, it, I think that's a very interesting question, James. And just to m maybe uh, continue on from what Steve was saying before, uh, to give it another angle, is when when you're working clinically, I think you have to have a flexibility of, of mind about these things. And whilst obviously the anima or the animus does develop um, in reaction to the opposite sex, I think it's also important to bear in mind too, for example, say, um, if I was working with, with a woman clinically, I'd also be interested in um, her animus as it relates to her mother, mm. because uh, um, the mother's animus um, will have an effect on how her daughter develops, uh, and obviously vice versa with respect to the anima um the father's anima would be uh instructive too in terms of how uh that that man's anima has developed so i think th th again that's just something else to look at and we've we've actually 
been working with some of those things mm. recently, haven't mm. we, clinically, mm. uh, where that's been the case. And it's actually been more instructive. Mm. Um, for example, uh, it happened to be a, a guy in this case, but it was more instructive to look at the his father's anima uh, and how that had, had, had affected his relating uh, as opposed to his relationship to his mother. So mm. I think that's just something else to bear in mind and, and uh, when you when you're thinking about these things because this is what comes up clinically mm. and if you just get stuck with that idea that it's um, really only coloured or conditioned by the relationship to the oppositely sex parent uh, and you know other people as that person goes um, through life then you're limiting your understanding um, of how these things happen so uh, I would just yeah. throw that into the mix really yeah, definitely. Um, something worth considering Definitely. And it, of course, it uh, supports the notion that it's the relating function that's, yes. that, that, that uh, is this issue. Yeah, as, as far as my own anima development has, has gone, and I'm only 23, not been on the journey super long, um, the thing which has helped me the most is relating to Jane. Bar none. Zero. And uh, so that, that kind of goes goes to show if it is, is a relating thing. Because, you know, I'm sitting there, uh, INTP, I guess, I'm thinking all, all, the, all the time. If I can't relate properly to her who's the most significant woman in my life and i mean properly relating then it's like it doesn't matter how many inner women you get to meet it doesn't how much active imagination you do you know how how, how spiritually enlightened you feel you are it doesn't matter because practically day to day that's what's going to that's a part of your own life your own lifespan and everything else that's important to you so yeah i, I, I would fully support that based on my own experience for what it's worth anyway the second question that night child asked uh, in terms of you know how do you go about your own creative process would you guys like to tackle that or simply just to direct people to the previous video that we did on this topic previous video i think james yeah, yeah but um it was a very helpful question and um but it is probably more properly answered in that context yes. where, where we looked at that but that would be great thank you brilliant okay i'll link that down in the description down below but thank you nightchild for your question and uh, we've got another question from nightchild as well you're really you're using the infinite question thing properly which is exactly what i do in your situation as well so well done uh and and, and you ask uh, what in your opinion is the usefulness of drawing mandalas i've tried drawing them recently and have noticed they get more complex every single time and i wonder if there is a correct approach to do this or that is not possible because it's a representation of the self and therefore wholly individual. From my personal experience, I, I, I really don't like the woo-woo stuff, personally. I, I, I just don't like it because it's not functional. It could be a product of my personality, it could be a product of my scientific upbringing, I don't know. Drawing a mandala is you're drawing a shape on a piece of paper. That's basically what you're doing. So there is no, as far as I can tell, and as far as I'm concerned, I'm, there's no way I'm accessing the self by drawing a particular shape on a piece of paper than I am drawing a man or I am drawing my fan or my bed or anything like that. I'm just drawing a picture. Now, if it's a meditative exercise and you're enjoying it, I, I know I really enjoy like free drawing. I'm doing it more and more now. I'll close my eyes and see what naturally would want to come up. I'm not expecting to be connected to the self, the, the, the genomic self, but it's a meditative exercise and see what comes up. So if it's useful, do it. But as far as I'm concerned, you're not accessing any deeper spirituality within yourself purely because it happens to take on a certain geometry i don't know what you guys think uh, i'd agree with that james ha having done it a very very long time ago um i think it can end up just being uh, that you just doing something about doing something so you're not really doing anything at all yeah. um i mean that there, there, there may be some um diversional value in in doing it um <clears throat> or you know some kind of displacement or di distraction into something but i think that's i think you're absolutely right to say that that's completely different from doing something which is essentially creative um so yeah i i think it's uh the, the, this, there's so much stuff out there too that encourages people to do this kind of thing now too all these illustrated drawing books and it's like you just have to go and buy one off the shelf and take it home and colour it in and somehow yeah. you know you'll have some kind of uh, profound experience by doing that whereas really you know it, it, it's it's just a distraction it's just just a displacement really probably um, maybe away from other things so I, I, I certainly yeah. wouldn't bother with it myself now 
Yeah, I mean, Pauline was an occupational therapist in both acute and chronic psychiatry in the 1980s and in the early 90s as well, uh, and early 2000s. And uh, she mm. would be using activities like that all the time yes. with psychiatric patients mm. who, in Young's day, w would have been expected to produce these things naturally. Yes. Um, I don't know about Pauline's experience, but, but my compared to Pauline's limited experience of acute and chronic psychiatry, is that they didn't give a chance. They wouldn't do that yeah. unless it was doodling. Yes. Um, also, there are so many different ways in other cultures of, of utilizing geometric patterns, and the Jungians very often say this: this is this is something that proves the fact that mandalas are important in the way that they mean that they're important and uh, the magic circle you know with respect to western tradition um, and how the forces are contained outside the circle but the operands the magus whoever sits inside and that's the opposite way around in the east where they project into the geometric pattern and control it there or they they move they have a, a way of moving in a geometric way when you really look at it none of it none of it to be truthful is going to do anything other than just fix a relative state of unconsciousness into another state of unconsciousness. So you're moving mm. that from one form to another, unless you do something with that that is active and dynamic and put that into the fabric of your life. And again, it's mm. only in the context of mental illness that you're going to see whether this stuff really works or not, or whether it is in effect just like doodling. Yeah. Now if people want to do that, if people want to, um, follow some of the the more esoteric side of, of young and think they're getting an awful lot out of it well then they probably are but it is not universally applicable and that's the problem because if it were universally applicable everybody should be doing it all the time naturally without being told yes, that you should do it it's prescriptive isn't it unfortunately it's, it's, it is prescriptive yes. if it were what it is claimed to be no one would need to be told to do it mm. no one would need to be told how to interpret it yes that wouldn't happen it would just happen everywhere everyone would be doing it mm. and we'd all be sitting there mesmerized in front of them but we're not we're mesmerized by iphones mm. by televisions and computer games and things like that <clears throat> it it'd be better to dream a mandala than to do any kind of active imagination or drawing on it because dreaming is relatively uncontaminated and young was clear about that but then young also did indulge himself massively because he could you have to remember this is a man in complete control of his environment for the whole of his life, particularly when he got married. And he married into money, which meant that he could have the house that he had on Lake Zurich. Mm -hmm. But as a psychiatrist's money could never have bought that. I mean, I've been there. We've both been there. Yes. We, we know just how luxurious and how well built that was and how expensive the land was. Never mind what he then did at Bollingen. And most of that money didn't come from his psychotherapeutic work, it came from his wife's family. Now, this was a guy who lived a long time and did a lot of good things. Um, and he, he put his, uh, his psyche into stone at Bolling and he did all of these things, he did sculpture. All of that was, was absolutely wonderful. But if you try and copy that and put that into your own life, when you don't have the freedom he had over his environment, to do what he did mm. you'll find there's an there's a disengagement between the facts of your life yeah. and what you're trying to achieve on the inside it'll just be hollow it, it will be hollow because you can't do it no one can be carl young he was a one-off and you, you really do have to understand that so yeah ma mandalas can can be helpful and if you study them and you go cross-culturally and you look at it in, in tibetan buddhism for example you're going to learn a lot, but don't get fixated because mm. you're actually missing the naturalness that's trying to come through. Mm. If you dream with mandalas in, I would say that's very significant, particularly if you've not been drawing them or not been chasing them. Yes. Because otherwise you're going to have a mandala complex and it will be that that's produced the dream. And very often dreams don't just compensate or complement. They actually have a laugh at you, you know. You have to be really careful with them. And how you interpret them in that sense they're very very close to the ancient greek oracles they will lead you astray dreams sometimes if you you know your attitude of consciousness is too one-sided or two sided or inflated 
it will overamp the error in order to, as I say, quite frankly, take the piss out of you. And if you can't learn that message, then it'll, again, it'll just pull away. It will withdraw from you. You know, it, we know this from direct experience over decades. And, I, you know, yeah. I, I don't want to push that, yeah. uh, particularly, except to offer it as experience. But there are things, unless you go through them and experience them, you can't know. You can't uh, impose creativity. No, you, no, you certainly, you certainly I mean, can't do that. No, no. no. I, I think, you know, when you're saying about sort of um, my days in acute psychiatry, where we'd maybe have a group of 20 plus people all in, in various states of, you know, distress and on different kinds of medication. Um, so in that sense, a very uh, heterogeneous group of people all being put in the same room and asked to do you know told that they were had to ha doing creative art therapy and maybe given a, a a brief to work through work to um and you know it, it doesn't it that kind of thing does not produce real creativity at all it's purely diversional yeah. and and that's a concern really isn't it that, it is yeah. yeah you know if you're prescriptive about mm. some things that you won't uh, achieve the goal that you're after yeah yeah it, it is really really important to understand that when you acquire information consciously and you attach yourself to ideas and philosophies and beliefs this becomes the property of ego consciousness it's not the unconscious if the unconscious gives you something mm. without you asking for it that's completely different but, but the minute you start to, to tinker around with things and impose a structure, this is a criticism I, I have of typology. The typology is all about ego consciousness and what can be potentially conscious with respect to the ego without that much effort. But the deeper you go in, that disappears. So you really do have to be open enough to allow the unconscious to communicate with you directly in its own terms. And it may well be that you can use a mandala as a prompt but don't you know become obsessional as some people do about yes. drawing these things mm. we've, we've experienced people doing that mm. the minute you do that you actually devalue its usefulness yes. as a prompt by all means do one meditate on it and set it aside and then see how the psyche reacts if you don't it's impolite you're not giving your unconscious a chance to respond you're bombarding it with a superimposition of images that because the ego believes that that's what you should be doing, it actually interferes. Now, in a relatively stable psyche, that won't do you much harm because the unconscious will just ignore you. But if you're unstable and the unconscious is very, very close and there are fracture lines going into the ego, into your ego personality, and, and you start to do the wrong thing, you don't know what you're going to call up. You know, you, you've got to be very, very careful. It reminds me of the of the Jungian community in general. This this is one of the things I guess I can bring to the table, having having gone through this type of thing. Someone might dream of a snake, for example, and they'll come out and go, "Well, this is like a deep, powerful symbol, and it must mean this because it seems to be a deep, powerful symbol." But you are the vessel of consciousness and your own psyche, and it just is. So it reminds me of a dream when I was doing the Ion series about a year ago. Now I, I thought this was a really significant dream. And it was like Christ appeared before me and Satan appeared before me and they were fighting or something. And I was drawn to Christ and I was pushed away from Satan. I was like, wow, this is, this is real. I was, I was analyzing it in real time in the actual dream, not knowing what I was really doing. And then they were fighting, but then they unified and a voice spoke out and said, you must create a church of Christ and Satan like unified together and i woke up i was like oh my god this must have been like a dream of the self it must have been a dream of the unification of opposites so like, this is this is a path forward and it's like no you've been reading too much ion that's there's that's literally all it really meant it wasn't a deep powerful symbol it was the unconscious going hello hello sort of like laughing at me a little bit so it's like when going forward with these things i found it useful almost to take an evolutionary approach and it's like you don't you, in many ways, you don't need Carl Jung or Jungian psychology. It's, it's tools primarily to help people get better when they're sick. But ultimately, the Jung to live by, and, we, and we've had comments on this before, why are you following Jung if it's, if it's become yourself? Well, the idea with that is it's your psyche and it's unto itself. So rather than go outwards and look at the different symbols and the mandala and what this might mean in this particular version of this philosophy from this period of time, and it appeared in my dream even though I was already studying, it's like, just go in. Just go in and introspect on yourself. That to me seems like the proper way forward because 
biologically, how would we have coped before Carl Jung? How, how, how would you have learned to know yourself without understanding what the symbol of the snake meant? Or that the mandala was apparently a symbol of the self? It's like, go in. What's the psyche trying to tell you? And, and the, the dreams I've had that are far more significant are ones that have zero archetypal imagery in them whatsoever. They're personally acquired material that then recur over time. Like, uh, I, I've got some I, I could go into, but I probably won't now. But they were way more significant than Christ or, or a snake or, or a mandala. It's like, just go in and see what your own psyche wants to tell you. I've, I've had loads of religious dreams. I, I've, I've had... Uh... I've had Gnostic dreams of incredible intensity. And this is going back for 35 years plus. Um, quite shaking ones in, in terms of the intensity of the experience. And I was just, I was studying Gnosticism. And, you know, that, that yeah. is... The psyche will react to the it, psyche, won't it? It, will, it will react yeah. to it. And if you'd never heard of Gnosticism, you hadn't studied it, and you then had a Gnostic dream, that's entirely different. Yeah. Uh, and I, I find those things interesting and, and worth pursuing. But you know, we have to understand that, that the unconscious is not the conscious mind. It, it's not. It doesn't speak in the same way, but it does react to us. And whatever we're learning and focusing on, if we identify too much with that, then the reaction we get may just be a tricksterish kind of reaction. And you know you can be fooled. It's just like you know, the the Greeks were very familiar with this with respect to the Oracle of Delphi and the other oracles as well. How you read that, and very often it was the opposite of, of what it appeared to be, mm. or you were just into self deception. And you know you can only prove this over time. I mean we've got dream journals going back to the nineteen seventies, and we can see patterns, and we can correlate that with where we were at on our journey at that time. But the absolute critical thing was working with, for me, with other people because it gets you out of your own head. You know, there are lots of factors, lots of factors. There. And plus, on the individuation front, you know, did nobody individuate before Carl Jung? Was he the first man to do it? He he defined and coined the term, but before that, no one did, and no one will after him, and no one will now who's never heard of him. Well, obviously not, and he would not have said that. He produced a method for individuation which was based on his personal myth. And insofar as that dovetails of other people, it will reach them. But surprise, surprise perhaps, in the real world, most people aren't bothered about Carl Jung or his personal myth at all. And yet the natural impulse to individuate and to stop suffering is there and is present. Now, all of that said, all of it said, we can go back, we can go back to Jung. And we can take out of it what really works with real people. Yeah. And it's not a case of throwing everything under the bus, as somebody commented no. No. about Ion no. the other day, saying you've thrown Ion under the bus. I haven't, because why would I do that? Why would I throw it under the bus? You know, if it's relevant to the person I'm working with and to their stage of development, and very often a work like that will be relevant in a religious context to someone who's struggling to understand vast forces that are bubbling away inside them simply because they haven't developed a stable ego personality and, and when you haven't but, you, but you're maturing and you're banging up against the real world the unconscious will produce a lot of religious symbols in compensation for the fact that you're withdrawing from real life you, know, you have to be careful about how you interpret things well, thank you, Nightchild, for your question. Appreciate it, as always. Uh, and the next question comes from Simond, or Simond. You did tell me the correct way to pronounce your name, but I have forgotten. I'm sorry, my friend. Uh, and, and you asked, um, you mentioned some therapists lauding quantum theory because they perceive it as offering them a cosmos of endless mutability and thus their own pet beliefs, endless legs. It appears that in the sciences there exists something of a rivalry between quantum theory and field theory. Does psychosystems analysis lean, therefore, towards the field theory side, or is it something as yet to be determined? I'm, you know, obviously, it's not my field. I'm not a specialist. I'm interested in, in quantum mechanics and uh, in advances in physics and in field theory and, and the rest of it. Um, to put it into the, the, the context of, of Jung, for example, he was not a good statistician, and that's allowed people to criticise heavily his work with Pauli, for example, 
uh, and his work on astrology and, and, and these other interests that, that he had, that he employed uh, statistics to try to prove. In fact, it's been debunked. That's unfortunate because it means you can't take his results that he's applied the statistical method to, to, to be of any value. You can look in the background of that outside of statistics and see, is there something of potential value? But that's the direction I was coming from. And also the fact that quite recently there was um, a YouTube uh, PBS broadcast from some uh, people who are at the heart of modern physics and debunking a lot of this new age appropriation of quantum mechanics and the various schools, because there are various schools of quantum physics and, uh, and uh, their interpretations are different and they're, they're in a rival state anyway. So there's, there's all of that. So I don't think I, I'm at all qualified to come to any kind of conclusion on that in its own field. I would only refer it back and say that, that young statistics were flawed. That's a, that's a huge problem. And then secondarily, there is definitely the appropriation of both of those approaches to attempt to justify some of the more fanciful esoteric approaches to the psyche and to, and to, to uh, human existence. Um, and I think that's a waste of time, personally. I really, really do, because you're not doing anything about developing or growing. Uh, it's completely separate. There is another theoretician who interests me. Uh, he's controversial. He's a biologist, uh, and that's Rupert Sheldrake. There's a lot of controversy about him because people accuse him of being a kind of a neoplatonist or even a real platonic biologist, if there can be such a thing. Um, there's a lot of Aristotelian force in, in, in what he does as well. And there are some holes in what he does, but he does come up with some very anomalous results and lateral ways of looking at things. I find that interesting because it's something you can grapple with because not everything that he goes on about you can be debunked and so you can put that in the context of field theory but it's more of a biological field theory rather than one that, co that comes from um, from physics so uh, to answer the question then where I'm at is that I, I, I leave the physics to the physicists and then I would I would look at how that affects the psyche and how people's belief in what they think physics is with respect to the psyche uh, but with uh, Rupert Sheldrake's work, um, I've been kind of following him in a different sort of way for about the early 1980s at least, since um, the science of uh, New Science of Mental Life, I think it was called. It's up on the shelf anyway. And some of his, his, his later work, very, very intriguing. But uh, I've seen so many people, it's called Woo Woo, I understand, on the internet, who translate physics into Woo Woo land. And they don't they don't mix at all. It's oil on water, so that would be interesting, I think, to look at for people. This is slightly off topic, but there is an interesting question built into that. I discussed. I first heard this idea from Ilya Dubovoy, who I did a video with last September or so. It's called something like the evolution of archetypes. Now, my understanding of archetypes then and now are two completely different. And someone actually, they went back and they actually commented on it and was like, oh, your understanding of archetypes has completely changed. So maybe I should do a follow-up video on that with, with, with new ideas. But the, the interest here, or my interest with, with the physics on this, is especially in the realm of complex psychology, maybe you guys can help me with this. Where is consciousness localized? Is it the brain? Or is it a neural circuit? Or is it matter as such? That's a, that's a weird question. Because if it's just at the resolution of the brain, then the sentient nature of complexes, to what degree they are sentient, and they are, how does that work if it's just a neural circuit? So where the thing in physics that most interests me, basically, is where, what resolution is that consciousness? And the, in that archi uh, Evolution of Archetypes video, there seems to be, and there's, there's a decent amount of um, uh, mainstream biological support for this, is that DNA itself has a level of consciousness that it seems to be able to mutate itself based on what it needs, rather than purely environmental pressure. So rather than a responsive thing, it's more a proactive thing, which is very weird. So whereabouts could that consciousness be? I don't know if you guys have, have thought about this at all, but something that interests me I guess. Obviously it's important um, but unfortunately there are gaps there that allow woo-woo interpretations to come in and most of the stuff that's woo-woo you can see it has a psychological base um, just like Jung when he commented in um, the psychological foundation for belief in spirits you know his paper on that 
uh, and his work on the occult and, and, and so forth. There's an insistence that amongst people, some people, uh, that their definition of consciousness, which is usually ill-defined, um, supersedes everything. Uh, and that consciousness is everything. They don't define what consciousness is, but when you actually listen to them and allow them to articulate, effectively it's a projection of an expanded ego, their own ego, out um, into a sense of omniscience, into the environment, into everything else. Because consciousness is everywhere, then they are. You know, it, it, it's connected to things like panpsychism and, and, and other such viewpoints, philosophically and religiously. But um, the thing about consciousness is that when it's not there medically, it's really obvious. Mm. You know, it doesn't take much to reduce it, mm. to alter it, to extinguish it. Um, that is commonly understood, consciousness. Are you uh, thinking of coma states and the like? Yeah, co uh, coma states, uh, ingestion of um, substances, yeah. uh, sleep, fatigue, yeah. um, altered states of consciousness, including mm. so-called possession mm. states, mm. Um, which can be uh, anything from an alleged spirit down to a complex, mm. becoming an, an ego-identified function. Uh, dreams. Yeah. Obviously, you know, uh, we experience dreams, but young, the Jungians talk about um, a dream ego or dream ego, and that is separate to your conscious ego, but there is a continuity of identity between those two states that suggests that it's still the same person or the same identity. There's certainly a resonance, but it's not exactly the same. And that in itself is interesting. Uh, consciousness is definitely material in the sense that it has a material analogue. If, if you were to blow somebody's head off completely and uh, eliminate it, would these people say that that individual ego consciousness, which is reliant on sensory perception, it's reliant on a heart that's beating and supplying oxygen, and are they saying that this still exists at the point of uh, utter irrevocable uh, damage? You know, mm. are they saying that? Uh, now, all of that said, you then have... Uh, demonstrably experienceable paranormal so-called phenomenon um, parapsychological phenomenon in the broadest sense uh, things that tend to suggest that consciousness relies on a sensory input that is shall we say an information processing function which is not obvious that doesn't mean to say that it is woo-woo it just means perhaps we don't understand it which is why I've said on podcast that I don't say that anything is other than material so you could call me a materialist because i don't know where matter begins and ends and th there's a lot of problems with scientific classifications and atomic theory is the obvious one democritus of abdera the greek defined an atom as the smallest indivisible part materially that you could get to and then by the time that modern atomic theory was, was developed, they took on that name for what they considered to be the smallest, most indivisible part of matter. And then they said, oh, Democritus was wrong because now we've, we've gone further than the level of the atom. Well, Democritus wasn't wrong. They just misappropriated the term. The definition was it was the smallest. You'd have to go down to the, what's called the Planck length in order to, to, to find the most indivisible part of matter. And, that, and, that, and the Planck length has to do with space as well as matter, where things start to, to, to lose their ordinary definition. So they didn't define it properly and then blamed Democritus. When really the truth was is that they'd never found an atom yet. Not a Democritus atom. They found an atom of their own making and of their own projection. So there's an analogy there with respect to Democritus and atomic theory with how people make definitions and then decide that's it. And that's why I will not say that something is non-material because I've no idea where it begins and where it ends. So even with paranormal, parapsychological phenomenon, I'm not satisfied that they have nothing to do with matter. Um, and that it's just as you say, James, it's a question of resolution. And when it comes to consciousness, anybody who's dealt with death, I mean, the, the, the real material phys physicality of somebody else dying uh, violently or um, having to deal with the body afterwards you know um, 
you know there is a complete absence of life. You really do. Uh, and in all probability, a complete absence of consciousness. You have near-death experiences, of course, but that's not death. That's a near-death experience. Mm. True death is an absolute state. Uh, just as a true atom is an absolute thing, it is an indivisible thing, according to, to Democritus. So you can't really go back and redefine what he meant and say that he was wrong. You know, in his terms, he was right. So we have to be really careful about how we define things and then be open to experience. Agreed. Completely agreed. Okay. Well, Simon asks a second question here, and it's simply this. Do you have any recommendations for introductory learning in the field of psychoneuroimmunology? I have some basic grounding in biology and neuroscience already. Are there particular works from Rossi or from Cheek one should begin with, or do you recommend a more general work prior? What would you say, Paul, from their books? Um, yeah. They are the leading guys. Pa yeah. Pauline is way, way more advanced than me in this. Oh, I might have to move skulls. Yeah, yeah sorry, do you, want some, do you want a hand there? Move the skulls, just casually move the skulls. Move the paleoanthropological skulls, yeah. yeah. It's the, the original work, isn't it, by those yeah. two guys, yeah. Let's get it. Sorry, James. Sorry. Yeah. Do you want to yeah. offer a bit, is it? Yeah? Okay. you got that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I've, got, I've, I've got, got the same book as you guys. Oh, yes. I do. Mind-Body Therapy, Methods of Idiodynamic Healing and Hypnosis by Rossi and Cheek. Mm. Rossi is a very senior Jungian analyst, so orthodox trained, um... And he's also the closest student of Milton Erickson, the greatest hypnotherapist so far who has ever lived. And he's a psychobiologist. So absolutely go to him if you, if you, if you want to learn this stuff. But one thing you will find, if, if you look at any of that work, is you won't find any mention of the anima or the shadow. Yeah? Mm. You, 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 you will have archetypes and you will have complexes, but they're put into a proper dynamic living context that you can then extrapolate from and deal with all of these psychocultural manifestations that we call the anima and, and so forth. So in that sense, he is cutting edge. He is really, 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 really world leading. Fantastic. He revolutionized our practice. Oh, without a doubt, yeah. Revolutionized it. We were able to do things through what he had provided that we could not have done before. So yeah, you know, I, 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 we would, I'm sure, recommend it anybody and yes. everybody who is into therapy studies him, mm -hmm. uh, and also it it shows the absolute value of hypnosis as well for a psychodynamic therapist. Yeah. There's some very good case studies in that book. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, yeah. Paul, well, they yeah. are. No, yeah. yeah, absolutely, they they are amazing. Um, so it's it's worth looking at from that point of view to show just what can be done. Yeah. Um. I mean, Cheek was a, an obstetrician and gynaecologist and obviously a lot of traumatic things can happen uh, in that branch of medicine. Uh, and they used hypnosis to stop hemorrhaging and, and, and all sorts of things. So, um, and you know, it burns. And burns as well, which yeah. obviously are, is a huge amount of shock very often involved with burns. Mm. Um, but it, it, it's useful from that point of view really to show how these can, things can be applied and I guess to some extent that's that's why we're sort of trying to emphasize the things that we are because mm -hmm. we're trying to show what works clinically for people um we've seen so much bad practice we have we have haven't yeah. we mm -hmm. Um, and that is of a concern to us, um just purely from a humanistic point of view um and I think to have you know love and compassion for people i think is hugely important and clearly there's a there's a spiritual dimension to that alone it's not specific to any particular religion um but it's a huge part of what you do as a clinician it's been a huge part yeah. of, of of what we mm -hmm. do um and so i think if we can steer people in the right direction so that they don't waste their time on some things or they you know they don't expose themselves to uh, things which go on out there under the name of therapy, um, then that's that's what we want to do. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you, Simon, for your two questions there. And we've got another question. I think this is the fourth one from Nightchild. I approve of how much you're using this. You're offered something and you take it. I like it. You're a man of action. So Nightchild asks, what is the psychic nature of what is called ADD or ADHD? I've always had problems focusing on whatever I was doing, even when I was interested in the task at hand, such as reading. I've heard that ADD is not a real thing, 
And I wonder if what we call ADD is in fact just a neurosis of some kind. What are your thoughts? Um, Ooh, wow. I've, well, it's, it's a, <laughs> yeah, did you want to go? Yeah, it, I think it's like a, a lot of classifications that, that um, there's probably many things there that are lumped together uh, and, and that can be a problem. Uh, there's definitely a, a psychological element in it. James, I'm sorry, that noise is so much. I'm going to have to go out and kill him. Um, I may have, I'm, I'm have to speak an Anglo-Saxon out the window. <laughs> do it, do it. If, please scream out the window, then we can get it on film. We can well, put what it he, what he normally intro. does, James, is he allows me to put my head out of the window and, and then he shouts profanities. I and do. Then, like, <laughs> I'm doing it. <sighs> yeah, in, in the manner of a ventriloquist. <laughs> It's one of those fashionable diagnoses, and it's particularly fashionable to use it against uh, young men, yes. uh, as dyslexia was before it, and they're, they're very often mixed. Yeah. Um, and you get an iatrogenic effect of the medication as well, mm. which is important to appreciate, that, that when people are on the medication for ADHD, they begin to suffer from the drug, uh, and that then becomes a circular proof that they need to be on it. Yes. Um, and if you internalise that, you then get a diagnosis complex, which is understandable. This is a generalised thing. People will do this in their exposure to psychiatry, for example. Um, very often, it's just instinctive pressures and lifespan development, mm. particularly in young lads. They're being frustrated by the environment, and then mm. you get a reaction to that, which is psychosocially conditioned, but that psychosocial con conditioning affects them physiologically as well and certainly in terms of the self-concept and then you do get a psychological element that is present we've we've witnessed some some oh, terrible yes. things yeah. uh, and also quite staggering reversals and re-emergences of these diagnoses under psychosocial pressure where they've been switched on and off like a light depending on an external referent you know, and uh, with some self-disclosure, I think we'll probably be adequate yeah. here, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yes, it, yes um, it probably would, yeah. Uh, our, our son, Gareth, who we ended up taking out of school and homeschooling him, and it, we, we were successful at that because he's gone on and uh, developed into a very, very mm. well-adapted, um, very physically well-developed, uh, very emotionally developed young lad. Um, he didn't fit in at school at all, yeah. so he had to be diagnosed. Uh, and they said he had dyslexia and or ADHD. And it's always young boys. It's always young boys. Um, and we took him out. We took him out because of something that was abusive that happened to him yes. at school. Yeah. And we, we, we began to home educate him um, mm. through personalised education, which is the way to reach him because he is an intuitive um, and he has a very fine mind and he's very creative. When we were doing that, uh, it would, the particular topic was science. In fact, it was cosmology. This was a young lad who was able to do that. These skulls, by the way, were made by him uh, and others. And then a letter arrives, and it's from the school. This is when we were in the process of withdrawing him. His writing was absolutely perfect, and part of his diagnosis was he was dyslexic. Yes. Mid-sentence, when he realised that it had come from school, he started to turn into a dyslexic because he'd heard that the letter was there. And the, the psychosocial force of the suggestion from the school that mm. he was dyslexic was sufficient to alter his writing mid-sentence. Before that, it was perfect. Copper plate, everything was spelling was perfect. No pressure on him, but that did it to him. Uh, anyway, we, 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 got, we got around that. And then, you know, when he, when he was nine, he was working in a local museum as a, as a demonstrator, you know, um, and he was making skulls like that. And the museum was so impressed with him that uh, a PhD, Laura Bishop from Yale, who happened to be working at um, Liverpool John Moores University, came in and asked him to have private lessons in paleoanthropology at the university at that age. Uh, well, he did for, for a while, but you know, our son being our son, he decided he was, it was too easy and he was no longer interested in it and, and wanted to go do something else instead. And uh, okay, that's fine. But w but what it proved is that he was intelligent and given the opportunity to express that, then the ADHD alleged and the dyslexia alleged would go. But also 
that the psychosocial pressure of the diagnosis was sufficiently real time to reinsert itself into his behaviour. So that complex popped back in again, attached itself to his identity and his self-concept sufficiently to change him in that moment real time and we caught it, we caught the activity of the complex at yeah. that time. So I would say in every case, in every case, look to the potential as being frustrated in that child or in that young person. Look at the trajectory of their life, as in where it's going, not just where it's come from. What are the potentials in them that are, that are trying to come through? Because most people who suffer, suffer from unactualized potential. Tap into that, and then you'll get a relaxation of the compensatory symptoms and then you can just bypass the psychosocial inductions and suggestions and pressures and prejudices. Of course, a lot of schools are paid money to diagnose these There's kids. There's incentive to put children on special needs there is. registers. There, there, and there, there was back in the yeah, day with Gareth. There was. Without a doubt. And he's absolutely fine. Mm. He's, he, was a, he was a really good kart racer until he got too tall and heavy. Um, so in that sense, he had that competitive spirit. He was also a good athlete. He was winning races. Um, and never got an award for it. The person who lost, and then the others who were ahead of them on the yeah. losing, they all got. And this is like this is ridiculous. And there, there was a particular form mm. of toxic femininity. I'm sorry to say, no, it, there was. That was behind this in all cases. Yeah. Um. So yeah, we we understand this was this was some time ago because our, our lad's 25 now, isn't he? Yeah. You know, um, coming up to. Uh, we understand <clears throat> what this present generation have been through, and are going through now. It's really really bad. It's no wonder they escaped into fantasy to the extent that they have. It's no wonder. It's no wonder at all because he no, did. He did. He yeah. did because mm. his home life was supportive. Um, the way he was being educated was not supportive, uh, and the culture itself was suppressing his instincts. Yeah, I go as far as far as to say it's unnatural yeah. for young lads yeah, to have definitely. to go and sit definitely. in a classroom. Totally agree. For however many hours a day. Mm. Um, I do. I think it's contra naturum, yeah. and I can remember when he first started school. I, you know, four or five, um, and his class teacher, which who happened to be female, saying to me that um, because he was quite, you know, excitable and didn't want to sit still and all the rest of it, that she thought he would be more mature than some of the other boys because he was a few months older than them, mm. like at four and five. Yeah, I mean, it's just, yeah. just incredible and nonsense isn't yeah, it really it is, uh... it is so i would say individual cases always mm. just like you would in the clinic you treat everybody as an individual mm. get rid of these broad classifications yes. if they apply if they are real then that's different because you then have to deal with the fact of its reality but if it's not if it's an artifact that's been imposed yes. by an individual or by a reward and punishment system from a culture through a teacher to a child, that's malignant and it must be resisted. Mm. But if you can access the potential in a young person or in a developing person or in an older person whose potential was arrested when they were young, you will liberate them. Mm. And, and surely, as parents, as therapists, as human beings, that, that's what we should do. Agreed. Completely agreed. I have um, I've had friends before who've had ADD or ADHD, uh, and I've spoken to people as well who apparently have it too. Um, I, I can understand why you why they'd be classed as different because they have inability to focus. But to be fair, I've never had a difficulty focusing. But I've been called ADD and ADHD before. Just well, it's just, just, just ego again, isn't it? Yeah. Where, where, where's your life force going? And and it's going in a in a, a direction that doesn't satisfy you. It's going to look for for other av avenues Absolutely. of expression. Mm. And, and, and rightly so to me that that's actually um, a normal reaction to an abnormal situation. So you have to ask yourself who's at, who's at fault here? It's so easy to blame children, isn't it? And to classify them and to say they're out of step, out of kilter, you know, uh, with the, the, their social environment. Yeah. But, you know, most, probably nine times out of ten, that's not the case. That's no. not been our experience, no. has it? No, the more potential a child has, the more they will suffer. Yeah. And it's the same for an adult as well. Yeah. But unrealised potential. Mm. And remember, you're under instinctive pressure to self-realise and to self-actualise, which is why, you know, um, people suffer down to the level of instincts. Mm. That's why, you know, I say, for example, at the heart of every neurosis, you'll find one or more instincts. Uh, and if you stop you know, at the level of what appears to be archetypes, there is a great danger you'll disappear into fantasy. Mm. Because out in the environment, it's so rich in fantasy now 
that if you stop at that level of explanation, you're going to lose the person you're working with because they'll just use that to reinforce the split and the separation between them and their instincts. And instincts are more fundamental and they're far more complicated in terms of their structure than they've ever been, or recently anyway, uh, been given credit for. Yeah, but if you can't express them in the environment, they're going to go somewhere else. They are. You know, if you, yeah. if you can be a, a hero in a, in a video game, yes. but you can't in real life yeah. because the culture's against you, yeah. it's, yeah. it's going to go that way. Yeah, and then you just call it an archetype or lots yeah. of archetypes. Yeah. No. no, no, you're looking in the wrong place. You really are. Yeah. And you, you only know that when you work in depth with so many people. And quite literally, we've worked with thousands, <laughs> you know, so that's a, that's, a, that's a lot of experience. And I'm not trying to say that that um, overrides other people's experience, but it is a corpus of experience that has value and merit because these are real people. It's not a theory, it's real. Mm. And uh, that, that's where all the proving ground is. It really is. Yeah, my, my stuff with um, being called ADD didn't really happen until I was an adult, until like, over the last few years. And it was like, I would stop turning up to things I was like, am I a bad person, or am I? Am I? If I, you know, can I not focus because I'm not turning up to things? So I was asked, like, why aren't you going to any of these compulsory lab meetings? I, like, I don't want to. Go away. No I, I don't to want to. And it's like, well, how how can you not? The the professor told you to. It's like I couldn't. Oh, I couldn't yeah. care. The, the professor could feck off for all I'm, I'm concerned. It's like, I, I don't. I don't want to. But also built onto this question as well, and I wouldn't be saying this about necessarily yourself, night child. But you said you have difficulties focusing even when it was something that you're interested in, such as reading. I, I've spoken to a few people recently about this, where they've said the exact same thing as you, is that I can't focus on reading, I can't focus on reading. Well, my simple question would be, why the hell are you reading? Is it because you want to, sincerely, or is it because you think you have to? And this is where this we were talking about prescriptive nature of things a little bit earlier. Yeah. There is, and this is what I, I tried to get across in my video on how I integrated my shadow, my own my own personal myth story. It's like the, 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 the prescriptive nature of things that you think you have to do, your instincts will kick back against them. They really will. So it's like, you can't sit and make yourself read a book because you feel unconsciously that you have to. And this is the thing, people come up to me with Jordan Peterson's reading list all the time. They're like, oh, should I start here? No, don't start there. He's got the painted bird on his reading list. Why would you read the painted bird? One, it's fake. All the evidence points that it's fake. And two, it's horrible. It's his reading list. So you don't need it, you know? And, and, and indeed, built in with reading, I get asked as well, what, what do you read all the time? It's one of the first questions people normally ask you, what do you read? And it's like, not much. Or if it is, it's things that I want to because I'm drawn to them or they're like tools. No, so there is no, I must read collected works X, Y, Z to become a wise man or else I cannot. It's like, just just go in, as you were saying earlier, go inside. So many like, ways of learning, aren't there? Mm. Yeah, so I, I guess it's follow your instincts and do what you want to do or else you're going to end up getting not particularly happy over a period of time. In the case of where somebody uh, can't even read things that they actually like or enjoy, then there are a number of possible causes there that may not be the ADHD, alleged ADHD, uh, but could simply be a complex that they've developed about reading. Yes. You know, there's, there's so many things factoring in, which is why people need to be properly assessed. But you need to look at psychosocial pathogens and um, people poisoning, as they used to call it, a Charing Cross, which I mm. think is a, is a good way of framing things. That We can get poisoned by other people. And, and young, you know, the equivalent for him would be psychological infection. Um, the suggestion that we get from other people that something wrong and then you start to comply with that suggestion and uh, you start to undermine those things that are of value and interest to you because they're not confirmed as being valuable in our relationship to other people so the whole thing then can become a malignant loop <clears throat> and at that point and again I'm going to say it and I know that people are fed up with me saying it there's absolutely no point looking at archetypes at that point you do need to cut it right down and say what instincts need to come through here to liberate this person from the trap that they're in. Mm. And then when you do that, what people normally call archetypes will appear but later down the road. Now usually um, when they are helpful rather than just disguise uh, what's going on for someone, then you know that they're on the way to getting well. Yeah, there's an insight, a real clinical insight that what people call archetypes tend to appear to someone spontaneously yes. when they're getting well. Yes. 
Mm. Um, but you have to access the instincts. If you go directly to archetypal la layers of explanation and interpreting archetypal images as being helpful and healing, you're in the world of fantasy then, and the psyche isn't ready for it because you've lost contact with your instinctive roots. It's an imposition again, isn't it? It is an imposition. Mm. But... Um, the women who run with the wolves. We haven't got mm. the book here, have we? Is it downstairs? It's downstairs. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> as I said, that's a very, very thick book, mm. and it's full of instinct. And the whole book is dedicated to getting women back in touch with their instincts. Yes. Um, the archetypes are mentioned in there, and they're illustrative, but the fundamental thing is instinct. Yes. Otherwise, there is no basis for the archetype at all. Mm. It's just fantasy, yeah. and. And trying to get people to see that mm. there is absolutely no point trying to be King Arthur if you don't know what the meaning instinctively of being a king is in your own life yeah. or why the, the, the role of king emerged mm. culturally, historically what does it mean and that meaning isn't just an archetype and an emotion, it's at an instinctive level because otherwise you'll stop at the level of the archetype, you'll stop at the level of getting off on the emotion of the identification, but do nothing about it. You know? So get down to the level of instincts. That will, that will blow everything away or into its proper place. It will rearrange everything. Because that's the real pressure that's coming from your genome. And you know, if you want to talk about the self as an archetype and it being psychology, well, it isn't just psychology. It can't be. That's just the impression of the biology that appears in your mind, of the genome as a whole, and of the idea within the genome genetically that you should individuate and become who you should be. By the time that hits consciousness, it turns up as a symbol of the self. It's a zip file. It's a compressed file of what you can understand and can appreciate. But it is not the totality that stands behind the self, the so-called self. That's pure biology. That's the ancestral spirit. The ancestral spirit is your ancestral DNA. It's at that level. People need to understand that. And as you said before, James, it's just a question of resolution. You know, at what level do you resolve the analysis of what you're experiencing? And so often we see people trapped by these fictions. They become hypnotized by mm. it. Mm. You know, um, James Braid, who coined the term hypnosis in 1843, said the mind becomes dominated by fixed ideas and then people go into trance and they walk around in a trance state that's what this is that's what fantasy is yeah. you have to be so careful and if you work clinically as a hypnotherapist you will see this you will understand it but if you approach it only from the level of superficial psychodynamic theory and at the same time you're indulging in fantasy environments through the internet and through gaming, through television, through Netflix and so forth. You're doing nothing about your instincts. You're just dissipating your energy out through these archetypal projections, which are really, as Jung called them, collective representations within the media. You're not living your instinct. You're doing something about it mm -hmm. instead of doing it. It's back to mandalas again, isn't it, as well? Yes, it's love the same, it is, yeah. It's the same point there. It's about, it's exactly, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Sweet. Well, in which case, that's all we've got time for today. As always, thank you to everybody watching. Thank you to everybody who submitted questions. And thank you to Steve and to Pauline, of course. If you'd like to have your question answered in the next episode of this podcast, which will be probably in the next couple of weeks or so, because what we're going to try and do is keep up as much as we can with the, with the load of questions, if you like, even if it goes to once a week or so. If the demand is there, then we will do it. And you can do so if you support us at the $10 tier or higher on Patreon. And so with that, we'll see you again next time. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Pauline. See you all again soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Cheers. Blessings.